Imagine you and your partner are looking down at your little baby girl born two days ago. You're exhausted, but filled with overwhelming love and hope for the bright future ahead of her. The nurse comes in and says they'd like to take a few drops of blood from your baby's heel in order to check that she doesn't have any of the 25 severe but treatable conditions we screen for in newborns. As you sign the form placed in front of you, the nurse says, you probably won't be contacted because it's most likely that test result will be normal. Don't worry, your baby will be fine. This may or may not sound familiar to those of you who have children. Most parents don't remember anything about being offered newborn screening because it's such a hectic time, particularly for first-time parents. So what if I told you we now had the capacity to screen for over 600 severe but treatable conditions that begin early in babies' lives? Many of them are very rare, with some affecting less than one in 50,000 people. But finding out that a child is going to develop a genetic condition before they have symptoms can have a massive impact on families. For example, spinal muscular atrophy, or SMA, usually fatal in infancy, can now be treated if detected earlier, leading babies to have much healthier lives. As well as being able to implement treatments earlier, we can also um, avoid long diagnostic odysseys for families trying to find the answer for that child's condition. And we can avoid subjecting babies to unnecessary and invasive investigations like muscle biopsies. So you might be thinking, how is this even possible? Well, we use a technique called whole genome sequencing. Our DNA is kind of like the instruction manual for our bodies. The genes are like chapters, and there are a lot of letters in each chapter. Whole genome sequencing is basically like reading through our entire instruction manual. And then we look for spelling mistakes. Those are what tell us that the gene might not work properly and we might develop a genetic condition. There are a lot of chapters to choose from and a lot of letters in each chapter. So this used to be really time consuming. But scientists have recently improved their processes, meaning this takes a lot less time. So now you might be thinking, well, this is amazing. And why aren't we doing this routinely yet? And I would say those are excellent questions because it really is quite astonishing that we have this technology now. And we know we have the capacity to do this kind of screening. My colleagues and I in Victoria recently did a pilot study where we sequenced 1,000 babies for 605 severe but treatable conditions that begin early in babies' lives. In those 1,000 babies, we identified 16 genetic diagnoses, where a standard newborn screening only found one. Those genetic diagnoses led to a range of possible interventions, from preventative strategies, such as being able to avoid particular foods or medications, all the way through to transplantation in potentially life-threatening conditions. So the technology is there, and we know there's no doubt that implementing genomics and newborn screening would help save lives. The question is, how far do we go? I told you that we only screen for those genes that are treatable and severe and begin early in babies' lives. But this technology means we have the capacity to screen for hundreds more conditions, some of which are not treatable. We can also screen for things that are less severe, or things that begin later in childhood or even adulthood. This may be starting to sound a little bit futuristic, like we're in a movie with Ethan Hawke and Uma Thurman. (laughs) But this is no longer science fiction. We are approaching Gattaca-like territory, and we need to decide where we draw the line. We need to think about what is the purpose of newborn screening. Is it just to help improve the health of that baby? If we find a non-treatable condition in a child, we can help those parents avoid having future children with the same condition. But is that a valid use of the technology in a public health setting? We also need to think about what kinds of information we allow parents to have access to about their children. Can you imagine finding out in a two-week-old that they might develop hereditary breast and ovarian cancer as an adult? Is that the kind of information parents should have access to about their kids? Or should we be preserving that child's future autonomy to make decisions for themselves whether they want that information or not, particularly for conditions where there might be no treatment or preventive strategy available? This information doesn't have to be a one-time only offer, though. We could actually store that genomic data and revisit it over the life cycle of that child at various stages. 
For example, it may not be very helpful to find out in a two-week-old that they're going to develop kidney disease at 10 years of age. But if we give that information a little bit later, parents can plan and potentially give treatments that might prevent disease onset. If we do decide to store that genomic data, we need to um, make sure we decide who stores it, how it's stored, where, and who regulates it. We also need to think about who has access to that genomic data. It might be helpful for researchers to have access to that genomic data that's been identified in order to help decide um, about future treatments. But how do we feel about commercial companies or insurance companies having access to that genomic data in order to help decide what premiums to charge? What about the police having access to genomic data in order to help solve crimes? We also need to help figure out how to support families to make decisions about what kinds of information they want to know about their kids and help them think through all the potential ramifications of screening. This is only going to get harder if we do this at scale because we just don't have enough people to train to have these kinds of conversations with families such as genetic counselors. We are in a transitional phase. The technology is there and it would be morally wrong not to use it to help save millions of lives. But whole genome sequencing is still expensive. And although current evidence suggests it saves more than it costs, we need more evidence and more research done to make sure this is the case at scale. We also need to make sure that we have enough healthcare system available to support this process and that we can implement it effectively. With the power to know so much information about our next generation comes great responsibility. A responsibility to ensure that we use that information and protect it in order to prevent harm. A responsibility to ensure that we preserve future autonomy of children where appropriate. And a responsibility to ensure the information is used to shape babies' futures in ways that have their best interests at heart. Thank you.